So for a while now, I've been wanting to make a video going over the CRISPR patent landscape. I think there's a lot of people who are in the dark and uninformed about who owns what in this CRISPR sector. So over the last many weeks, I've spent a huge amount of time putting together an in-depth organized explanation of the CRISPR patent landscape, and that's what I've got for you today in this video. And just really quick before we jump into things, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing below for everything on investing in CRISPR. And also consider checking out my Patreon page linked right below where I offer bonus content and also the opportunity to support the channel. And right now I have around 25 patrons and if I get to 50 by the end of January, I will make February's content free for every single patron. So February will be completely free. Your support means a lot to help me keep doing this. Okay, enough of that. Let's get right into things. I'm going to start with some overall important facts to clear away about the IP space. And then I'm going to talk about each current CRISPR company, just doing the public ones in this video, and talk about their IP and what they own. And then at the end, I'm going to zoom out and talk about the whole space and my thoughts on what companies are positioned the best. And to be clear here, this video is focusing on IP within the current public CRISPR companies, which does include the majority, but I did not talk about the private companies and their technology like Prime Medicine and Prime Editing, or Scribe Therapeutics, Mammoth Biosciences, or Sherlock, which I think needs its own video. So if you would be interested in that, let me know in the comments below. And I'm sure a lot of you will have questions or areas you want me to elaborate on, so my plan is if I also get to 50 patrons by the end of January to upload a bonus video exclusive to all patrons, answering everyone's extra questions, which you can just comment down below, and I'll also talk more about the companies that I think have the best IP in that video. So at the core of all of these companies is this CRISPR-based technology, which for the most part takes its roots at universities where major research takes place. So with these companies, a lot of their IP comes from where this technology was discovered. And so naturally licensing is a huge component in the space. And then these companies also have their own technology and according IP that they develop with internal R&D and collaborations. And some of the major institutions involved here are the University of California, specifically UC Berkeley, the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, Massachusetts General Hospital, MIT and Harvard themselves, Stanford, the Rockefeller University, Vilnius University, the University of Vienna, and a few other small institutions. And if you've been following the CRISPR sector closely, you would know there is a pretty important IP battle still going on over the foundational CRISPR-Cas9 patent rights. And I'm going to sum it up as briefly as I can here without skipping important facts. So basically on one side we've got the University of California, the University of Vienna, and Emmanuel Charpentier, which have been abbreviated CVC here, and all of which collaborated and co-owned IP covering methods of use in compositions for engineered CRISPR-Cas9 systems for editing DNA in different organisms, including humans. Their patent family is pretty large with 35 issued patents in the US and over 30 issued outside the US. And then on the other side, we have the Broad Institute, MIT and Harvard, which we'll collectively call Broad. And Broad has 26 granted patents in the US for CRISPR-Cas9 and over 29 patents granted in Europe and beyond for CRISPR-Cas9. And anyways, in 2015, CVC filed a request with the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, citing interference between their patent applications and patents issued to Broad. So there's a bit of a distinction between the patents filed by Broad, even though also for CRISPR-Cas9, but they discuss editing of genes specifically in eukaryotic cells, including human cells, citing that they were the first to be able to do so. And this is actually kind of true, but there's nuance here. And I'm not going to go into that rabbit hole, but I would definitely recommend reading Walter Isaacson's book, The Code Breaker, which recently came out, and that is linked below, which goes over this in depth. And I also might talk about this more in this Patreon video. Anyways, an interference is filed to prove or determine the actual initial inventor of the invention, which in this case is CRISPR-Cas9. And so in January of 2016, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, the PTAB, declared an interference involving one of CVC's applications, 12 Broad issued patents, and one Broad patent application. They called CVC the senior party and Broad as the junior party, which is important because senior party means being recognized as the party who was the original inventor. So that was a big deal saying that. 
But then a year later, in February of 2017, the PTAB dismissed the proceedings, saying that each party's claims to what they owned actually were distinct enough that they didn't conflict and meet requirements for an interference. And this is mainly because of how the patents are worded. And if you're like me, you should see a ton of ambiguity and gray area there. And it's definitely hard not to see conflict. And the CVC ended up appealing, but in September of 2018, the U.S. Court of Appeals ended up affirming the PTAB's decision to terminate the interference proceeding. But then CVC went on, and they went on to file new U.S. patents intended to create interference focusing on establishing the use of CRISPR-Cas9 in eukaryotic cells. And this second interference then forced the PTAB to look at the conflict and not throw it out, actually trying to determine who first showed that CRISPR-Cas9 could work in eukaryotic cells. The PTAB ended up still siding with the Broad Institute, but it's not over yet. Even now in 2021, there is still a third hearing and we still don't know yet exactly who will own what. The more likely option is that both parties will end up owning some of the patents with 14 patents from CVC and around 13 patents in one application from the Broad Institute up in the air to be decided. So that's kind of where we are and I promise you I'm moving on here, but I will definitely continue to refer back to this in the video. So hopefully you will remember some of this. And another thing important to mention here is that the patents last for 20 years. So a patent lasts for 20 years from the earliest filing date and you can't renew them. So after 20 years, the patent is gone. But one interesting exception to this is a PTE, a patent term extension. And these are possible under the Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act of 1984. And basically this law makes it possible for FDA approved drugs to get compensation up to five more years beyond the date of the patent expiring. And the length is in fact proportional to the time of the review process by the FDA. And this is only valid when there are less than 14 years left on the patent from the date of drug approval. So I thought that was worth mentioning. And for the patents discussed in this video, all of them expire sometime between, I believe the earliest being 2032 with the foundational CRISPR IP and the latest being right around 2040 and 2041, so right around when they would be filed now. And so because this range was tight enough, I'm not gonna specify for all patents discussed in this video, and I also will not be going into the details of all the royalties and milestone payments. Number one is that it would add probably 30 minutes to 60 minutes at least for me just throwing out numbers to you. And number two is because for all these licensing deals to be discussed, there are similar single digit royalties, milestone payments, and also stock milestones and stock payments, which every company is paying in some way for licensing deals. So I did not feel it was necessary, but if you really want a video going over that, you just have to let me know below. And I definitely would consider doing that if enough people are interested. I just don't think it's super important because for the most part, there are similar compensation plans. I also just really quick want to mention some of the major technologies which are important in this picture. So obviously at the roots of this, we have the fundamental CRISPR-Cas9 system with a focus on the transitional Cas9 nucleus, which is technically derived from the Streptococcus pyogenes and is called SPCAS9. But there are also variants of Cas9 which are used. The Broad Institute owns a lot of IP to this. For example, we have SA-Cas9, which is actually smaller than SPCAS9 and can be delivered via viral delivery methods. And also worth mentioning is sari cas 9 which is similarly small enough to be delivered via viral methods as opposed to SPCAS9. And there's also a bunch of other variants which you can see on the screen here. And then also we have HiFi Cas9, which is derived from SPCAS9, and this is what Graphite Bio uses. And then we've got other nucleuses like Cas12A, formerly called CPF1. We've also got the according AS Cas12A. And then there's CRISPR-Cas12B, initially called C2C1, and then Chardonnay, CHRDNA, which I'm sure you've heard of, is a gene editing system used by Caribou Biosciences. And then we've got Cas13A and Cas13B, which are RNA editors. And then of course we have base editors, which we have cytosine and adenine base editors and RNA editing systems. And then there's a bunch of others which we're not going to get into today since they aren't huge in the IP picture within the public landscape. But just throwing out some others here, we've got Cas14A, Cas13D, Cas3, or Casx. And there's a lot of emerging CRISPR systems. And of course, there's also prime editing and related enzymes. So what I'm realizing here is that I can make a separate video going over all of this. So if you would be interested in that, feel free to comment below to let me know. And then a few definitions to lay out. 
A license, I'm sure you know, gives another company the right to use certain IP in exchange for some compensation. And a non-exclusive license means that the company who is out licensing their IP, so licensing to another company, they are still allowed to use the IP in question. And then an exclusive license, on the other hand, is the opposite, meaning the company who is out licensing the IP, they cannot use that IP at all. It is exclusive to the company that they are licensing to. And then also worth mentioning is the PCT, which is the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is an international IP agreement governed by the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, with more than 150 countries agreeing to this. So filing a PCT application, also known as an international patent application, allows you to file a single application applicable to all these regions. Now the caveat to that is that it does not result in an issued patent in all these nations. It's not that easy. You only get a patent pending status. If you want to get an issued patent, then you have to move forward in each specific country looking to get a utility patent in those countries. But the advantage and the reason why you do this is that it gives you a time buffer to decide whether to spend money for the patents in certain countries rather than initially doing it. So this is a very common strategy. So let's start off here with CRISPR Therapeutics. So they have actually a very interesting licensing deal with Emmanuel Charpentier, which makes sense because Emmanuel Charpentier is one of the founders of the company and also owns patent rights, or at least co-owns patent rights to the original CRISPR-Cas9 patent portfolio, which I previously discussed. And so CRISPR Therapeutics has an exclusive license with Dr. Charpentier as of 2014 for their editing tech, which covers 50 issued patents in the US and beyond, as well as pending patents. CRISPR Therapeutics also has their own IP covering their own CRISPR-Cas9 technologies and development programs to add another layer of protection to their IP. These patents cover things like methods of use, manufacturing processes, dosing, and formulations, as well as modifications to CRISPR-Cas9, like improvements to component systems like nucleuses and guide RNAs, and also has IP for delivery systems like viral vector systems. And finally, they have IP related to stem cell based therapies. They have over 40 active patent families and over 50 granted patents in the United States and beyond, as well as current pending patents. And in 2014, CRISPR Therapeutics entered into a patent assignment agreement differing from a license in that the agreement transfers all rights away from the patent holder to the company, which in this case is CRISPR Therapeutics. And this was between Dr. Charpentier, Dr. Ines Fonfara, which is part of Charpentier's group, and the University of Vienna. And those parties combined to assign CRISPR Therapeutics the rights to a family of additional patent applications for compositions of matter, including additional CRISPR tracer Cas9 complexes and methods of use, including their use in editing DNA. And they have to pay milestone and royalty payments in return. And then going back to the licensing deal briefly between CRISPR Therapeutics and Dr. Charpentier, there's some more complicated mechanics within this deal, and it has to do with this other company, Tracer Hematology, which is co-owned by CRISPR Therapeutics and Dr. Charpentier. And there's a confusing and seemingly pointless licensing agreement from Dr. Charpentier to Tracer, and then Tracer to CRISPR. But essentially, and you can see here kind of how it works, and I don't want to waste too much time here, but this enables Dr. Charpentier to license rights to both CRISPR Therapeutics and to Vertex Pharmaceuticals. So that's what we have here for CRISPR Therapeutics. So let's try to move on quickly here to Adidas Medicine. So number one with Adidas, we have their licensing agreement with the Broad Institute and Harvard, which is one agreement. And while this was initially signed in 2014, it was amended in 2016 and 2017, where it excluded additional fields from the exclusive license and also converted the exclusive license from the original deal, which covered three specified targets to an unexclusive license. It also, and this is important here, revised provisions with respect to Broad granting further licenses to third parties that would be interested in developing products covered under the initial exclusive license Adidas had. And lastly, it amended their rights to reserve the rights to other gene targets that other institutions have interest in researching and developing that would otherwise be licensed to Adidas. This licensing agreement pertains to patents owned or co-owned by the following combination of institutions, MIT, the Broad Institute, Harvard, and the Rockefeller University. And this license is known as the Cas9-1 license agreement after being amended, includes IP for CRISPR-Cas9 and related delivery technologies. 
and as of the end of December 2020, they had 54 related U.S. patents, 30 European patents, and 56 pending U.S. patents, and 29 pending European patents, and then some other IP beyond the U.S. and Europe. And some of this IP is in fact under dispute in the undergoing interference trial. And this license excludes some fields like gene editing and animals or animal cells for gene xenotransplantation, like eGenesis is doing, for example. And it also excludes research and development into livestock applications as well, including agricultural productions or products providing nutritional benefits. And one key part of this is the fact that if the Broad Institute wants to designate a target to an affiliate or a third party that would be covered by the rights in the license, if Adidas or someone they've sublicensed to isn't actively researching or developing this target, and they aren't able to give the Broad a plan of how they would do it that satisfies them, then the Broad can reserve the rights to developing this target to someone else. And that's something we're going to touch on more in the end. And this is known as their inclusive innovation strategy. And it's something I think is definitely worth noting in the context of all of this. And then we have another licensing agreement, which is the CPF1 license agreement. And CPF1 previously being the name for CAS 12A. This license agreement was agreed upon in December 2016 and also includes an exclusive worldwide sub-licensable license to CAS 12A patent rights focused solely for treating human disease using gene editing, and also a non-exclusive worldwide royalty-bearing and sub-licensable license to CAS-12A rights for other purposes while excluding editing of the germline, editing plants, animal seeds, or tobacco plants. And interestingly enough, the University of Tokyo and the National Institute of Health are joint owners as well of these patent rights. In the similar arrangement with a third party interested in a gene target, so the inclusive innovation strategy applies here as well. Now, with respect to what Adidas owns itself, at the end of 2020, they own nine U.S. patents, 64 pending U.S. patents, seven European patents, and 56 pending European patents, and then seven pending patents in areas outside the U.S., and all related to their CRISPR technology and therapeutic programs. And three of the patents are co-owned with De Broad in Iowa, and 12 of the pending patents are co-owned with collaborators like Juno Therapeutics. And as of the end of 2020, they had in license a total of 88 U.S. patents, 44 European patents, and 500 pending patents. So very strong IP from Verve. All right, let's move on to Beam Therapeutics. Beam has patents or has licensed patents that cover C to T base editors, A to G base editors, A to I RNA base editors, aka repair, and C to U base editors, aka rescue. CRISPR-Cas12B systems, novel guide RNA sequences, methods for increasing base editing specificity, multiplex base editing in immune cells ex vivo, methods for evaluating base editing specificity, therapeutic methods, and delivery modality. And focusing on their own IP, at the end of 2020, Beam owned three pending U.S. provisional patent applications, six pending patent applications in the U.S., 25 pending international patent applications, and 33 pending ex-US applications. These patent applications are with respect to their base editing tech, base editor variants with enhanced properties or novel properties, and proprietary methods of using base editors like multiplex base editing, guide RNAs targeting base editors, and methods for evaluating base editing specificity. And focusing on DNA base editing, at the end of 2020, Beam had in license 24 U.S. patents, 23 pending U.S. patent applications, 3 pending PCT applications, 43 patents filed in nations outside the U.S., and 149 pending patents outside the U.S., all related to DNA-based editing. These patents are licensed from the Broad Institute, Harvard, Adidas Medicine, and Biopalette. And these patents include claims to engineer deaminase enzymes used in base editors, and compositions and methods of using such base editors. The IP also covers aspects related to their platform technology, which base editing systems that use the following are listed here on the screen. Now with respect to RNA base editing, as of the end of 2020, Beam in licensed approximately 10 pending US patent applications, one X US patent, and 47 pending X US patent applications from the Broad Institute. The patents include claims to novel base editors, compositions including the base editor as a component, guide RNAs that target base editors to therapeutically relevant RNA sequences, and methods of using such base editors including methods of using base editors for therapeutics. And for CRISPR-Cas12b, 
Beam has in license seven pending US patent applications and eight pending ex-US patent applications for CAS-12B from the Broad Institute. The patents include claims to methods of using CAS-12B to modify DNA and engineered or non-naturally occurring compositions, including CAS-12B as a component. Now, for the rest of their gene editing platform, Beam has licensed 22 US patents, 28 pending US patent applications, 44 ex-US patents, and 159 pending ex-US patent applications from universities and institutions. The patents include claims to compositions and methods for delivery of charged base editor proteins into cells, modification and improvements to the base editing systems, including improvements to the nucleotide binding protein component, guide RNA component, and base editing enzyme component of the base editing complex, methods for evaluating gene targeting and base editing efficiency, and compositions and methods for prime editing. Prime editing being a key thing there. And for CRISPR Cas129 and Cas12A, they actually have a license with Adidas Medicine for these technologies, which as we previously discussed, Adidas has a license from the Broad Institute and others for. So pretty interesting to see this interplay. So all in all, Beam has a ton of licensed IP. And as I also mentioned, they have their own patents and applications from technology they have developed as well. So a lot of exciting things over at Beam. So let's slide over here to Graphite Bio. In general, Graphite does not have a huge amount of intellectual property, but they did say in their S1 that they intend to expand their company by obtaining rights to more technologies via licenses from third parties. And as of June 2021, they owned one provisional patent application for genome editing and gene replacement for the treatment of beta thalassemia, this being for specific gene cassettes and sequences for targeted insertions into locations in the HPV gene. Now, with regards to licensing, as of June 2021, they in-licensed one U.S. patent application and six applications outside the U.S. from Stanford related to methods of genome modification using chemically modified guide RNA in primary cells. Now, the other institution they have licensed from, IDT, short for Integrated DNA Technologies, they have in-licensed one U.S. patent, two U.S. patent applications, and seven patent applications involving high fidelity nucleases, gene editing systems using mutant Cas9 nucleases, and improved methods of gene editing thereof. Now, focusing more on their licensing agreement with Stanford, this began in December 2020, and it covers human prophylactic and therapeutic products for the treatment of sickle cell disease, SCID, and beta thalassemia, and is a non-exclusive license. In January of 2021, Graphite Bio entered into an option agreement with Stanford, giving them the option to exercise a license to obtain patent rights focusing on other human prophylactic and therapeutic products, and this is non-exclusive as well. And they also entered into a second agreement in April 2021, an option agreement, to which Stanford granted Graphite the right to get a license for the treatment of Goucher disease and other diseases treated through the insertion of a construct into the CCR5 locus, and also diseases treated through the insertion of a construct into the alpha globin locus. And their license with IDT specifically is granting Graphite a worldwide, non-exclusive, sub-licensable license to research and develop and commercialize with respect to incorporating Hi-Fi Cas9 protein variants to use in applications for the therapeutics. And they also are granting Graphite the right to expand the license field beyond sickle cell disease, XSCID, and Gaucher disease to transfusion-dependent thalassemia and lysosomal storage disorders. So there's Graphite. Now let's take a look at Caribou Biosciences here. So Caribou actually has one of the more interesting, albeit confusing stories in the CRISPR sector regarding their IP portfolio. As of a few months ago, they possessed 48 issued US patents, 218 issued foreign patents, and 85 pending patent applications throughout the world. And they have been around for a while, since 2011. They have US patents covering their application of anti-BCMA binding for their CB011 platform. They also have exclusively licensed IP covering the anti-CD371 domains of their CB012 program from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And then going back to the original Cas9 patents, they have an exclusive license with the University of California and University of Vienna for a worldwide sub-licensable agreement to the foundational CRISPR-Cas9 patent family, which is mutually owned between the University of California, University of Vienna, and Emmanuel Charpentier as previously discussed. And with this valuable IP, they have made 20 sub-licensing agreements for these patent rights, going into all sorts of other fields like agriculture, research reagents, transgenic animals, livestock, 
internal research, bioproduction, cell lines, microbial applications, and forestry. And if that ruling goes against this group, it would be brutal for these licensing agreements. The interesting thing about Chardonnay, which is important to talk about since it's the fundamental technology that Caribou has to distinguish itself, is that it was developed under a three-year collaboration with Pioneer Hybrid International, now Corteva AgriScience. And the Chardonnay patents were initially owned by Pioneer, and what ended up happening is Pioneer granted Caribou an exclusive license to the Chardonnay patent family in fields of human and animal therapeutics and research tools, and also gave them a non-exclusive license to other fields outside Pioneer's fields, which in December 2020, they amended this agreement and assigned the whole Chardonnay patent family to Caribou in exchange for an upfront payment and potential future milestones, and also licensed Pioneer back around CRISPR-Cas9 IP, specifically from a patent family owned by Vilnius University. Now here's where things start to get interesting. In July of 2014, Caribou entered into a licensing agreement with Intellia Therapeutics, which gave Intellia an exclusive worldwide license to certain CRISPR-Cas9 technology for human therapeutics. The focus on exclusive and human therapeutics important here, meaning Caribou can no longer use that Cas9 IP for human therapeutics. And also was included was a license to some other future CRISPR-Cas9 IP, which lasted until early 2018. Intellia also granted Caribou an exclusive worldwide license to its CRISPR-Cas9 technology for fields outside human therapeutics and a license to some of Intellia's future CRISPR-Cas9 IP until a similar date. Intellia also opted into the previously mentioned Pioneer Agreement and got a license to the Pioneer background CRISPR-Cas9 IP. Now in 2018, Intellia initiated an arbitration over whether the CRISPR-Cas9 Chardonnay guides and Cas9 scaffolds were included in the licensing agreement. And in 2019, they ruled that both patent families are included in the agreement. But what they did was give Caribou an exclusive lease back to Cas9 Chardonnay guides, which was clarified in 2020 to only be eligible for their CB010 candidate. And in June of 2021, the companies resolved the dispute. And so in exchange for Intellia giving Caribou an exclusive license to certain IP relating to CRISPR-Cas9, including Cas9 Chardonnays, just for their CB010 product candidate, they will pay Intellia upfront cash of 1 million and up to 23 million in milestones, and then also a mid to single digit percent royalty on net sales of the CB010 drug until the patent expires, which would be 2036. So I've avoided including the compensation terms for other deals mentioned here today, but I thought it was important here so you can see that disparity. So you don't have to be a genius to see that Caribou did not end up on the winning side of this dispute, albeit getting the lease back, and actually in one respect they shot themselves in the foot by licensing over a technology that they created because it used Cas9. But the workaround is that Caribou is using Cas12A Chardonnays and have IP for that via an issued patent which comes from their agreement with Pioneer. And you can see the patent here on the screen. And then another agreement Caribou has pertaining to their CB011 program, a part of this drug relies on anti-BCMA single chain variable fragments or SCFV, which they took assignment of from ProMab Biotech in January of 2020. So they get this molecule on according IP that ProMab has applied, and they have a compensation program in return, of course. So that is it for Caribou and their IP. Let's slide over here now to Verve Therapeutics. So with Verve Therapeutics, as of May 31, 2021, within their company-owned patents, they had one pending U.S. non-provisional patent application seven pending U.S. provisional patent applications, and five PCT applications. Their combined own patents and license IP covers gene editing programs for PCSK9 gene and ANG PTL3, as well as their own RNA delivery and other platform technology. So focusing on their PCSK9 program, part of their company's own pending IP covers guide RNA sequences targeting the PCSK9 gene, mRNAs encoding adenine-based editors, methods of using these for therapeutic indications, and methods for in vivo gene editing, formulations, dosing regimens, and combination therapies. Now with their ANGPTL3 program, part of their company's own pending IP covers similar guide RNA sequences targeting the ANGPTL3 gene, mRNAs encoding adenine base editors, methods of using such compositions for therapeutics, methods for in vivo gene editing, the same exact thing as you can see here. Now, to talk about their licenses, in April of 2019, they entered into a collaboration and licensing agreement with Beam Therapeutics for an exclusive worldwide sub-licensable license 
under some of Beam's base editing tech, gene editing, and delivery technologies to develop base editing products and nucleus products using Beam's CRISPR-Cas12b technology directed to any of four gene targets and with PCSK9 and ANGPTL3 making up two of those targets. In return, in addition to stock, they granted them a non-exclusive license to patents controlled by Verve and an interested joint collaboration technology to let Beam conduct activities under agreed upon R&D plans. They also gave Beam a license to their delivery technology and patent rights for a delivery system or components that can be used to deliver base editors to targets. There is also expense sharing and milestone payment stipulations in this deal as well. Now another agreement Verve has is with Aquitus and most recently amended in October of 2020. Aquitus gives Verve a non-exclusive worldwide license, royalty free but with option payments under its LMP technology and gives Verve the option to enter into separate non-exclusive license agreements for a specified number of targets which they can further develop and commercialize for certain licensed products that use LMP tech. In October of 2020, Verve selected an LMP optimized under the agreement for their Verve 101 program targeting the PCSK9 gene. So they hence entered into a non-exclusive license for this with the right to sub-license it through multiple tiers under the licensed LMP technology. And this is to use with connection to the PCSK9 gene target. Verve also has a licensing agreement with the Broad Institute in Harvard, most recently amended in December 2019, known as the Cas9 License Agreement. The licenses include rights to patents owned by a combination of Harvard, MIT, Broad, the Rockefeller University, and the University of Iowa Research Foundation. And this deal grants Verve a worldwide, royalty-bearing sub-licensable license to Cas9 patent rights for PCSK9, ANGPTL3, and two additional targets. And inside this agreement, there's two parts to distinguish which is the Harvard Broad Cas9-1 patent rights, and that is co-exclusive to Adidas Medicine and pertain to patents owned by Harvard and the Broad Rockefeller University and MIT with varying ownerships. But then there's also the Cas9-2 Group B patent rights, which is patents co-owned by all four institutions mentioned, and those rights are non-exclusive. Broad and Harvard also gave Verve a non-exclusive worldwide royalty-bearing sub-licensable license to the Harvard Broad Cas9 patent rights for development and commercialization of therapeutics for humans outside the field of Adidas' exclusive license agreements with Broad and Harvard, and with respect to targets that are not Cas9 licensed products, but is a Cas9 enabled product, an important difference. Also under the agreement, Broad and Harvard have the same ability through their inclusive innovation strategy to grant licenses to third parties looking to develop products targeting genes that might fall in the scope of the co-exclusive license with Adidas, but one important exception is that it can't fall within the scope of cardiovascular disease. So if a third party requests this, Broad has to notify Verve number one, and if Verve or a subline C is developing the target, it's off limits. And if not, Broad also has to let Verve try to reach a sublicensing agreement. And if that can't happen, then Broad can terminate the rights to that target for Verve and give it to the other company. So that is a summary of Verve Therapeutics and their IP. Now let's talk here about Intellia Therapeutics and what they've got going on. Intellia is very strong on the IP side with their foundational sublicense CRISPR-Cas9 rights, improvement modifications of those systems, LMP technology, TCRs for specific targets, and cell expansion technology focused on stem cell-based therapies. This mainly comes from licensors Caribou, Novartis, and OSR. They also have their own in-house IP portfolio with over 40 patent families filed since 2015 covering solely or jointly owned technologies developed independently or with collaborations with Novartis, Regeneron, and OSR. Number one, they have a licensing and collaboration agreement with Regeneron, which was signed in April of 2016 and consists of two main components. The first being a product development component, which both parties agree to research and develop and commercialize CRISPR-Cas-based therapeutic products focused on editing in the liver. And then number two is a technology collaboration component where both parties will engage in research and develop activities to discover novel tech and improvements to CRISPR-Cas9 tech to enhance Intellia's gene editing platform. And in this agreement, Intellia granted Regeneron a license to their CRISPR-Cas9 technology and a sub-license to certain platform rights licensed from Caribou Biosciences, which is exclusive to each target selected and independently developed by Regeneron or co-exclusive with respect to targets that Intellia co-develops. And in May of 2020, they amended the deal, expanding the collaboration to co-develop products for the treatment of hemophilia A and hemophilia B. 
this collaboration focusing on transgene insertion capacities and was extended until 2024 where Regeneron can renew for two more years following. It also gives Regeneron exclusive rights to develop products for five additional in vivo CRISPR-Cas based therapeutic liver targets, which is a big deal in my opinion. And it also gives them non-exclusive rights to independently develop up to 10 ex vivo gene edited products made using certain defined cell types. Then another deal Intellia has with Novartis, and this was signed in 2014 and was a licensing and collaboration agreement. Intellia granted Novartis a license to its CRISPR-Cas9 platform technology and a sublicense to rights licensed from Caribou that is exclusive in the ex vivo, HSC, CAR T cell, and OSC fields per each target Novartis pursues. In return, Intelli gets access to 14 Novartis patent families relating to LMP compositions, methods of use, and modified nucleic acids. Novartis also granted Intelli a non-exclusive license to their LMP platform technology to use in all genome editing applications. Novartis has selected several targets for commercialization, which Intelia will receive milestone payments for. Also worth pointing out is that Novartis granted Intelia rights to use its proprietary small molecule for HSC expansion, which comes with a single digit royalty in if they end up commercializing the product. In another agreement, which was signed in June of 2017, is a licensing and collaboration agreement with Ospedel San Rafael, aka the OSR agreement. The collaboration involves research related to novel WT1 TCRs, modifying them with CRISPR-Cas9 to treat cancers, specifically acute myeloid leukemia and solid tumors. Intelli gets the right to use IP developed under the collaboration to develop therapeutic products and discoveries from the collaboration are actually included in their first ex vivo product candidate for AML, which is NTLA5001. The agreement also gives Intelli the option to obtain an exclusive license to certain patent families of OSR, and Intellia can obtain the IP for the WT1 TCRs identified by OSR in the collaboration. And they actually exercised this option in December of 2019, which they will have to pay milestone and royalty payments in return. So we talked about Caribou's deal with Intellia, but to go to Intellia's side of things, a reminder that they entered into this licensing agreement in July of 2019 with Caribou Bio for an exclusive worldwide license to human therapeutic and prophylactic uses of CRISPR-Cas9 related patents and applications as well as companion diagnostics to Intellia's product or product candidates. The license also included exclusive rights for Intellia to use CRISPR-Cas9 related IP developed by Caribou through the January 2018 cutoff. And the agreement also includes a non-exclusive research license to conduct R&D on product candidates and products. The patent portfolio from Caribou includes several US and foreign patents as well as patent applications owned or licensed by Caribou. And through January of 2018, Caribou had filed over 50 patent applications relating to the CRISPR-Cas9 platform, including modified and improved systems, which are included in the license. And also the patent portfolio includes an exclusive sub-license to the CVC CRISPR-Cas9 patent portfolio. And so Intellia has the right to grant subleases to the licensed Caribou patent portfolio to third parties in their field of use, and also, of course, has the right to use that license IP, which they are in fact doing. And then in July of 2015, Intellia exercised their option to include the patents licensed to Caribou owned by Pioneer Hybrid International, as previously mentioned. The licensed Pioneer portfolio includes applications filed by Vilnius University for gene editing and non-bacterial organisms. The USPTO has issued patents to them covering the in vitro assembly and use of a recombinant CRISPR-Cas9 complex to modify DNA, which you can see here. Then where things got interesting is on October of 2018, when Intelli initiated an arbitration proceeding against Caribou, saying that they violated the license agreement by using and also seeking to license two patent families related to guide RNAs, which were partially invented by Caribou, but were in Intelli's exclusive human therapeutic field, which they had rights to in the license, and this was before the cutoff date of January 2018. Almost a year later, in September of 2019, the panel rules that both Chardonnays in question were in fact exclusively licensed to Caribou, were in fact exclusively licensed to Intellia, but it still did give Caribou a leaseback opportunity. This leaseback, as previously mentioned, was for Cas9 Chardonnays just for CB010, which does require Caribou to pay royalties and milestone payments on. So that's it here for Intellia, and I'm going to zoom out here in a second, but when you look at Intellia, the company does look to be positioned extremely well right now with regards to IP. 
So after going through all the IP for the main CRISPR companies, I'd like to zoom out and give you my overall take on this IP framework and what stands out to be. And by the way, I know this video is one hell of a long video. So if you have actually stayed and then been watching through here, comment below PATENT in all caps. I am curious how many people have made it this far. One of the biggest things is that the foundational CRISPR-Cas9 patent rights, which are still up in the air and will have pretty significant implications in this CRISPR sector. As you have seen, many of these currently public CRISPR companies have IP which is licensed or sublicensed, coming from the Broad side or the CVC group, which covers the original Cas9 IP, and so the ultimate decision from this patent dispute could have significant ramifications on this IP. I don't think it will be as one-sided, that one group gets everything and the other side doesn't, it will likely be divided up somehow which remains to be seen. So that is something that is key to keep watching and seeing how that develops. Now one question that has been discussed lately is the IP around base editors and how CRISPR therapeutics or Intellia therapeutics, which both have said that they have and are developing, would actually be able to use if Beam owns the IP. But we can see and you'll remember that the base editing tech is licensed from Broad Harvard and focuses on targets. So if CRISPR Therapeutics or Intellia went to the Broad Institute and had a specific gene target in question, and then that target was not being targeted by Beam, they could follow the Broad's inclusive innovation strategy, which has several requirements that I previously mentioned, but it does allow for other companies to get a license to the technology that we might think Beam can only own and reach an agreement so they can develop and commercialize it. This seems unlikely though, because they are on different sides specifically with respect to the Cas9 IP dispute. But without this, I do not believe they could use a base editor to commercialize a drug without reaching an agreement with Broad or Beam. The other idea, and this is no guarantee, but if they were able to take base editors and make a fundamental improvement or change of the technology that it was extremely different from what it is today, then they could potentially patent that. But otherwise, these companies can't develop therapeutics using base editors without violating the patents that the Broad Institute has. I do want to briefly return to CRISPR-Cas12a, previously called CPF1, which as you might be noticing has really increased in popularity. And remember the patent rights here are a whole other ball game compared to the original CRISPR-Cas9 rights. Right now there are 875 patent applications or patents with Cas12a or CPF1 in the title abstract or claim listed under the European Patent Office. There are also currently 75 issued patents in the United States with CPF1 or Cas12a in the claims. And we do know that the Broad Institute owns the most comprehensive patents, with the European Patent Office granting the Broad Institute, MIT, and Harvard the first patent for CRISPR CPF1 in 2017. But there's of course other companies who have also been granted patents relating to CPF1. For example, Pioneer Hybrid, which has the IP for Cas12a Chardonnays, differentiates the IP from what the Broad has with Feng Zhang, for example, with the system used. And much like there are different variants of CRISPR-Cas9, which I mentioned earlier in this video, there are different variants of Cas12a, like engineered AS Cas12a, for example. So these iterations add a different twist to the IP. But right now I do see Cas9, Cas12a, Chardonnay, base editing, prime editing as the main big players in this space. And maybe we can include HiFi Cas9, which Graphite is using. But we do have others, which I think are definitely worth expanding on in a video going over the private CRISPR companies and their IP. Now, which companies do I think are best positioned with respect to IP right now? And if I had to rank them, I would put Beam Therapeutics number one, Aditus Medicine number two, and Intellia Therapeutics number three. But I'm also going to include Caribou Biosciences here. And it's a bit of a special case because they still have the ability to license Cas9 related applications, excluding human therapeutics, which Intellia has an exclusive license. But they still have the other applications, which is still valuable IP. A few other things that stand out, number one is Regeneron. Their deal with Intellia has definitely resulted well for both sides, but it's pretty interesting to see the extent of IP license to them to use for quite a few gene editing targets. So I think Regeneron is positioned very well in the gene editing space. I also think that their novel technology Verve has developed for their LMP delivery platform is very impressive, but what's really neat is that Beam gets access to this technology via their collaboration and licensing deal. So this is just another dimension of how well Beam is positioned. So a ton of information presented here. Obviously, I'm definitely leaving out a lot, but this was initially two hours worth, but I compressed it down without excluding meant information to make the video as information dense as possible. I'm sure I did miss stuff, which is why I encourage you to comment below further questions you might have and recall the contingent Patreon video I plan to make answering everyone's questions. 
If you'd like to support the channel at all, help me keep doing this, definitely check out the Patreon page. With that said, thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time.